thank you so much for joining us for this Wednesday evening service of First Baptist Church in Loosedale, Mississippi. Last week, I began a four-part study of the parable of the prodigal. If you're at all familiar with the New Testament, you know this story. But if you don't, it's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And in this chapter, Jesus tells the story about a woman who had a lost coin. He tells the story about a man who had a lost sheep. And he tells the story about a father who had a lost son. In each case, the person who lost something was desperate about recovering what they had lost. But it is the father who is most desperate and most earnest about recovering his lost son. Let me refresh your memory by reading the first few verses of the parable of the prodigal, beginning to read in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, There was a certain man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one was giving him anything. In these verses, we discover that it was of the son's own accord that he was lost. He wasted his inheritance. He wrecked his life. He lost everything. Last week, I told you about the characters in the story, two sons and a father. But specifically, we're talking about first the two sons who lived in the home. And I want you to think about which one are you? Last week, our focus was on the younger son, specifically on his departure. But this week, our focus is going to be on the younger son's return. Now, last week, I made a list of statements about this boy that are obvious from the story. First, he was a son. Second, he was a hungry son in his father's house, hungry for adventure, hungry for the world. There was a hunger in him for something other than what the father had to offer. Although he was loved in, in the father's house, he was even hungry for another kind of love, a love that in the end turned out not to satisfy, a love that left him empty and lonely and miserable. He was also hungry for blessings. He wanted provisions. When the father himself was the provider, he was the blessing. A hungry son, selfish and self-centered son also, uh, only looking out for himself. We also see that he was a desperate son, desperate to find what was missing in his life. But his desperation only drove him to an even deeper desperation. A materialistic son wanting to gather things, he only became more and more empty. He was a simple-minded son who went on this journey without his father, assuming himself to be wiser and more able. He was a wasteful son who squandered his father's blessings losing it all. The worst thing that he lost is he lost his relationship with his father. He became an immoral son, unconcerned about his own reputation or the reputation of his father. And his actions uh, caused him to become a spent son. He was spent financially. He was spent morally. He was spent emotionally. He was spent physically. But worst of all, he was spent spiritually. So the picture that Jesus paints for us in this story is of a man who is distant from God. The delight of the distant country became a dreadful famine in his life. He began to be impoverished. He began to be in need, but that was only the beginning because he was only beginning to plumb the depths of his own emptiness. So what does a man do when he begins to feel his own personal emptiness? Well, you know what we do. We begin to take steps to meet our own needs and that's what this boy did. We read in verses 15 and 16 how he hired himself out to a man of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And 
The young man got so hungry he was ready to eat what the pigs ate, but nobody was giving him anything. It was obvious that the steps he took to meet his own need only took him deeper into the far country and farther and farther away from his father and causing an increasing degree of personal emptiness. Eventually, he hit rock bottom and was ready to eat with the pigs, but there was no mercy from anyone in the far country. Now, there's a very real possibility that all the characteristics that I've just mentioned are characteristics of your life. You are the younger son in the far country. You are the pastor in the far country. You are the deacon in the far country, or the young wife in the far country, or the lonely widow in the far country. You are the one who is spent and in need. What should you do? Well, to find out, let's read a little more of the story, beginning to read in verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Remember when we ended the story last week, we stopped at verse 16. We left the boy on rock bottom. He had a ruined and wasted life. We left him, as we've already said, so desperate. He was ready to eat what the pigs ate, but nobody was giving him anything. Isn't it a fact that sometimes a person has to hit rock bottom before that person comes to the end of self. That's exactly what happened to this boy in the story. In his emaciated condition, he came to himself. That's what the English Standard Bible says. But did you know that every other modern translation says he came to his senses? But literally, the Greek word is he came to himself. For a person to come to himself First, it must first mean that he is away from himself. Somehow, he lost himself. He forgot who he was. How does that happen? Well, it happens every day. Every day, somebody becomes so focused on something, some passion, some sin, that they forget who they are and lose sight of all that is really important in life. This young man was so focused on the far country and so focused on getting away from the father, all he could see was what he could enjoy in the far country. And he invested in all of that and ended up losing himself. Here is one of the great tragedies of sin. To pursue sin is not just to turn your back on God, but on who God made you to be. You abandon true personhood in search of identity and wind up losing your identity. Do you realize that the devil is the original identity thief? He's the one who wants to steal, to kill, and destroy who God made you to be. Has he been successful in your life? It's also true that by experiencing rock bottom emptiness, this young man came to himself. How many times have you seen a family rescue a person in their family from this fate. They bail them out of trouble. They pay the bills. They fix the problem. But in doing so, they only prolong the pain until finally the person hits rock bottom, sometimes taking the family with them. It's the pain of rock bottom that caused this boy to come to his senses. 
Sin has a numbing effect. It dulls the senses that really matter and heightens the senses to things that don't matter at all. In a sense, this young man sobered up. He came to himself, and by, and by coming to himself, it was a journey. At first, it was a downward journey into the desperate emptiness of the far country. How far did he have to go to get there? All the way to the bottom. Is that what will happen? have to happen in your life? Will you have to lose everything before you finally realize the magnitude of what you've lost? What had to be wrenched from his life before he saw himself clearly? Everything. His dignity, his humanity, his self-esteem, his reputation. I'm sure you know others like him who lose their job and their family and their future and more. But losing all of that is what brought him face to face with who he was, where he was, and what he lost. He knew in his misery that he was one step short of losing his very life. So what did he go looking for in the far country? Well, haven't you heard people who made similar journeys and say, well, you know, I'm looking for myself. What happens? Well, usually they lose themselves before they find themselves and realize they never should have made the journey to begin with. They were always better off at home. Have you come to yourself, or are you still in some far country trying to discover who you are? In the father's house, he was hungry for the far country, and now he found himself hungry in the far country, and hungry in the far country, he became hungry for the Father's house. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. It's interesting to me, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but in this story, the father divided his wealth between his sons and yet was still able to have to hire hired men and to provide them with more than enough bread. At that moment, the prodigal is still thinking about himself, still thinking about his own needs, but he did at least remember that in the father's house was inexhaustible wealth. His statement in verse 17 is revealing. He said, I am dying here with hungry, hunger. He was so hungry, he was ready to eat with the pigs, but no one in the far country was offering him any food or compassion. He was dying with hunger in the far country, but wasn't it hunger that drove him to the far country in the beginning? He could acknowledge that. Did he, in his hunger, was he seeking a relationship with the Father? No, not at that point. Really, he was seeking only sustenance, something to eat, just something to help him survive. And he was expecting some degree of punishment when he went back to the Father and the possibility of life as a hard labor servant but at least he would live. What was it he wanted at the father's house? Well, he wanted bread. There was more than enough bread, but it wasn't bread that would hunger, satisfy the hunger of the prodigal. It was the father. So he came to decision. He said in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. What do you see in that verse that he recognizes about himself? He recognizes that he was still a son. He said, I will arise and go to my father. There is something here that we need to consider. You need to stop and think for just a minute. Remember who's telling the story. The prodigal is not telling the story. The story is about the prodigal. From whose perspective is this story told? It's told from the perspective of the father, from the perspective of heaven, if you would. The prodigal's dignity in this story is never based on how he viewed himself, but on how he was viewed by the father. So is yours and so is mine. Likely you have a story to tell about yourself that you tell to yourself about how God feels about you. And usually our perspective about ourselves is wrong. 
The perspective you need is God's. And God's perspective about this boy is, here is a son who is lost, still a son, still loved, still missed, still welcome. Now, the prodigal is yet to realize that, but he does come to an important decision. He said, I will get up and go to my father. What was the risk in that? Did he risk rebuke? Did he risk rejection? I suppose he risked all of that. But he was now more desperate and more hungry in the far country than he'd ever been before. There was no mercy in that far country, but at least he felt there would be mercy in his father's house. So he said, I will get up and go to my father. In what condition did he make that journey? Well, he went bearing the filth of the far country. He went with no robe on his back. He went with no shoes on his feet. He went with no ring on his finger. He went wasted and guilty and empty. And he said, I'm going to my father. He went as a sinner. He sinned against his father and he sinned against God. That's significant because now the son is more than just hungry. He is repentant. He says, I was wrong. I have sinned. And he realized that something about himself that he didn't realize before. Before he said, you know, before he left, you remember what he said? He said to his father, he said, you know, I'm your son and I have things that I deserve from you. So what I want you to do is I want you to give me the share, my share of the estate. I'm a son and I'm worthy of what you have. It ought to be mine. Now he comes back saying, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. He was asking for nothing but mercy. But ultimately, there was an inevitable journey that he had to make. So what did he do? The Bible says he arose and went to his father. He had to face the father. He had to go and stand before the one he sinned against and be ready for whatever the father would say, whether that would be rebuke or rejection, whatever it was, he knew that his only hope was to get up from where he was, from the condition he was in, and go to his father. Now we come to the point of the story as far as this boy is concerned. Because you see, at some point, all of us have been the prodigal. We've been in the far country. We've wasted blessings and years and things God has given us. Some of us have hit rock bottom. Some of you are on rock bottom right now. What is it that you need to do? You need to get up from where you are, out of the mess of whatever you've made of your life, with all of its filth still clinging to you, and you need to go straight to God. And you need to say to Him, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Do whatever you will to me, but give me mercy what will happen to you? Well, look at what happens in the story. The Bible says here, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him exactly what he was going to say. Father, I've sinned. I'm not worthy anymore. Just make me a hired servant. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I want to tell you that the only thing you can do is simply get up from where you are, from whatever puddle of sin you sit in and go straight to God and say to him exactly what the prodigal said to the father there you are at the Father's mercy, empty, filthy, dying, and unworthy. You must be willing to let God be God and do what only what He can do in your life. And what is it that God wants you to do? I'm going to tell you. He wants to make you a son if you've never been one. But if you've become a prodigal, He wants to restore you to sonship. He wants to put a ring on your finger, a robe on your back, shoes on your feet, most of all, he wants you home. I want to ask you today, are you ready to make that journey? The Father's arms are open and waiting. Arise and go to the Father. Tell him, 
Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy. From that point forward, God will do the rest as he welcomes you home. Thank you so much for listening.